So I'm going to talk, as Sherry suggested, about the research I've been doing that relates to identifying and trying to improve care for the very high cost patients. But what I really want to talk about is how to do that in an evidence-based way so we can learn as much as possible. Um, and I'm going to describe a, a, what we did in New York on a recent project. And we came very close, but ultimately totally failed. And I'll tell you a little bit of that story. <laughs> and this focus on high cost patients comes from a chart that looks like this, which is we know that roughly 20% of, of patients are driving 80% of the costs. And the project I'm going to talk about is something called the Chronic Illness Demonstration Project, which took a bunch of very sick Medicaid patients who were disabled. And even those very sick patients, it's a 20-77 rule, which is 20% of the patients are driving 77% of the cost. So um, that suggests you ought to do predictive modeling to try to find out who those patients are. Because there's no new money. And if we're going to save money, we've got to identify the patients who are the high cost patients. And the intervention will have to pay for itself out of savings from those patients. Um, that means that, again, the cost will have to be offset by savings. That means case finding is going to be very important. We have to find the patients who are going to be high cost next year, not high cost last year, because people who were high cost last year aren't necessarily going to be a high cost next year. Um, there's regression to the mean, and resources on these patients who aren't going to be high cost next year is going to be wasted money. You're not going to be able to sa save any money. So um, that suggested to us that the focus should, should be on high cost events that you think you can do something about. And in the healthcare system, that means we're talking about hospitalizations. We're going to have to find hospitalizations. It's where the money is. It comes in big chunks. And there's lots of evidence that a lot of hospitalizations can be prevented. Um, but we've got to understand this is going to be really hard. This is the Medicaid context. And these patients have lots of complex problems. There's lots of research suggesting some of these care coordination things can work in middle class patients. But whether they can work on these really tough, high cost patients in the Medicaid program remains to be seen. And by the way, this intervention has to take place in something called a healthcare system. I put that in quotes because most of you realize we don't have a system. We have a bunch of providers doing lots of different things but not talking to each other a lot. So um, I'm, now getting, I'm a faculty member. I get to dream. So I'm going to sort of give you the idealized approach to how to do this on an evidence-based basis. So we said, let's see if we can predict who's going to be high cost next year using administrative data. Let's learn as much as we can about the characteristics of those patients from that administrative data to help design the intervention. Let's then tie it out the, the algorithm on, on a set of patients who look like they're high cost and find out from them what else is going on that's not in our administrative data. And then get a bunch of smart people in the room and design the intervention. Don't design the intervention before you know the data. Use the data to help design the intervention. Totally new concept. Um, we tried it. And then the next idea is, well, let's then implement it. And let's Im implement it in an experimental mode so we can learn what's going on from these patients. And we can then help tweak the intervention, but um, uh, assess the impact of it and do it in a way where we would learn as much as possible. And then disseminate our results and scale it up if it works. And I bravely call this evidence-based management and policymaking. And what you're going to see is we, we didn't quite get there. So uh, yeah, we, we almost got it right, but then not so much. So step one, we actually did this. So step one, we took Medicaid claims data from five years, and we tried to take, take the four years and predict what the remission was going to be in the fifth year. We used fancy regression techniques and come up with a risk score of 1 to 100 for everybody. And then we apply the, um, the results to real-time data and identify the patients who next year we think are going to be high cost. So these are the kind of things we looked at prior hospitalizations, prior intervals of hospitalization, prior ED visits, emergency department visits, diagnostic information, the things that we thought in our data would help predict who's going to have an admission in the next 12 months. So we look back 12 months, try to then predict in our, in our historic data what's going to happen in that fifth year, and then we apply it in real time. So here's our scorecard uh, in the development run. So if you have a risk score cutoff of 50, we were right about 67% of the time. So it's a pretty good model in identifying who's going to have a hospital admission in the next 12 months. Um, so, but we can learn more. We want to learn more about how, what these patients look like so we can design the intervention. So, um, these are real sick people. Lots of chronic disease, lots of multiple chronic disease. And what you've got to be asking yourself as I show you this data is, what should the intervention look like for these kind of patients? They've got other problems too. Not only have chronic disease, they have a history of, of behavioral health problems. High rates of substance abuse, high rates of mental illness, and more than half have both. Oh, and many have, don't have a medical home. So remember, these are people with a risk score of more than 50. They're very sick patients. You saw how sick they were with chronic disease. Almost 20% have had no primary care, especially care visit 
in the last two years. And then another 18% have multiple visits, but they're going to so many different providers, we call them shoppers. They don't really have a medical home. So as we think about the intervention for those patients, we're going to probably want to have a medical home for them. And oh, by the way, they cost a lot. So the average cost of these patients is 46,000 and 26,000 in the hospital. But that helps us figure out how much we can pay for the intervention. We can make different assumptions about how many future admissions do you think you can knock out. That tells us how much we can spend on these patients in, on our intervention. So they end up, the, the state did a demonstration project where they end up spending about 3,000 uh, per patient. And so that suggests they're gonna have to knock out 13% of future admissions to break even. This is an ugly list of the kind of conditions these patients have in the hospital, and these are the things they have to knock out. So lots of substance abuse, lots of mental illness, lots of chronic disease. So we then did the next step, which is let's go try this and interview the patients to find out what's going on. And that turned out to be extremely important. So the first thing we found out is these people are incredibly socially isolated. 50%, more than 50% are living alone. Most of them never married. 16% have no friends or family. And another 48% uh, have two or fewer. So these are very socially isolated patients, which means the intervention is not just going to be a healthcare intervention. It's going to be a social service kind of intervention. Many don't have a medical home. We already kind of knew that. But for them, for 42% to say their medical home is the emergency department was not a good sign. And then 60% have a housing problem. So we're going to have to recognize that if we're going to solve their problems. 28% were living on the street. 8% were um, in a shelter, and 24% were living with friends or family. And remember, these are substance abusing, mentally ill patients. That's not likely to last long. So we got a bunch of smart people in the room, or we thought they were smart, and tried to figure out what, we, what it ought to look like. And I'm going to go through this, and you've got to be asking yourself, well, how much can they really do of this? So the first thing, these are complicated patients, so you're going to need a multidisciplinary approach. You're going to have to have some sort of integrated, organized, coordinated healthcare delivery system. But not only that, they got social problems. So we're gonna to have to have that system coordinated as well. We're probably gonna to have to have somebody that's gonna be a care service coordinator arranger, give them a reasonable caseload size, and really give them the job of helping these patients solve their problems. Not necessarily health problems, that may be non-medical problems they have to help them deal with. It'd be nice to have data close to real time because we have no idea what we're doing. And if we wanna learn along the way to try to make things better as we, as we learn, we need to have close to real time data. And then you actually need some data in real time. If a patient's in the emergency room, you need to know about it because you need to get there and prevent them from being admitted by having a good community plan. If they're being discharged in the hospital, you need to know about it so you can have a good plan for them in the community. Um, and then if the patient themselves think they're in trouble, you need to know about that. Now that problem got solved by some of the people, some of the programs like giving them cell phones with a speed dial to the care coordinator. They lost a lot of cell phones, but it was a very effective uh, technique. And finally, we're going to have to think about the incentives in the system. Most importantly, if we're not hospital admissions, we've got to get the hospitals a little bit more comfortable with that idea by probably some sort of shared savings agreement. So that got us then to the next step, which is let's do a pilot of this intervention. Yeah, this is where the wheels came off, okay? <laughs> so there's my list that I just showed you. And my best estimate is we could do two of those things. We could have teams that were interdisciplinary and we can have a care coordinator. The rest of it was going to be really hard to do. But that didn't stop anybody. So the state went ahead and funded a $20 million pilot program. Um, and they, as I said, they gave $3,000 per patient for the care coordination, $250 a month. Um, unfortunately, CMS, that's the Medicare or Medicaid folks, they said we couldn't randomize patients, which is going to make my, my trying to understand what really happened difficult. But we had a really great plan. What they said is you have to have the same services to every patient in, in the geographic area. So we said, okay, but we can have it in some geographic areas, not others. They said, yeah, that's fine. So we said, we'll do zip codes and we'll randomize them. Now, we didn't tell CMS we were doing that. We said, we'll do it in some parts of the state, not other parts of the state. We thought this was really, really clever. Um, but you're gonna see it, it didn't work. So basically, they started implementing it. Um, and what they found was they couldn't find much of these most of these patients because the address information they had wasn't very good. So when we gave them a list of high-risk patients, they only found 15 to 25% of them, which means my great plan of randomizing zip codes wasn't gonna work because the people they found are gonna be fundamentally different than the people they didn't find. And so I can't just compare people in the zip codes that has the intervention with the ones that are in the zip code without it. But in the middle of this, we have the Affordable Care Act, and they said, this is a great plan. Let's do it all over the country. 
And so they created a new program called Health Homes and special federal money, a 90-10 match for Medicaid if you do a program like this. So Undata in New York said, well, that's great. We'll expand our program of pilots from 2,000 people with a goal of going to 700,000 people. So uh, I'd say the wheels came off here. Um, uh, step four, we did the scaling up OK. <laughs> But, but we forgot about the rest of the stuff. And so I call this management and policy making. This is pretty much what we do. So, so what's next? Well, we have another great plan. But you're going to have to wait till the cocktail hour to hear about it.